Okay, here we are. Are we good? Yeah. All right, welcome. Yeah, it's a couple minutes before 10, so if anybody's on early, you're gonna get a, a extra little bit of chatter. Um, is everything set up good? Yeah, you like the way you... I think we're okay. We've everything. got enough space here, I think. Yeah. But, uh... Should should show well, yeah. Yeah. I think. <laughs> yes, well, it is last Sunday when we met. It was bright and sunny. Today it's dull, dreary, and rainy, but uh, we're almost into April. And uh, we always like to say April showers bring May flowers. <laughs> so we're looking forward to that as the rain uh, nourishes the earth. And uh, spring truly is able to spring forth in wonderful ways. So uh, I do love a rainy day myself, um, whether I'm at home or whether I'm working. It's not so fun to be, have a rainy day while I'm riding my bike, which that has happened a few times. But, <laughs> uh, but I do like rainy days. And so I love this day. And hopefully you're off to a great start as well, uh, wherever you're watching us from. And uh, we are just delighted to be here with you again. Uh, are you? I just don't know how to refresh on this thing. We'll just pull it down. Like, uh, or didn't want to do that. Yeah. Anyways. Um, just, just carry on. Yeah. I'll figure it out. And <laughs> yeah, just trying to figure out a technological thing. Well, you could uh, go out of that and, uh, and then go back in to see how that works. Anyway. We uh, don't want to get too caught up in the technological stuff here that uh, we forget to keep talking. Uh, so I wanted to start off today by uh, sharing with you a psalm that is one that I love. I remember that uh, Pastor Jim Whitehead, who was uh, leading the, the, the graveside burial for my parents, uh, for both of my parents, uh, who passed away a few years ago, that he shared this psalm at the graveside and I remember thinking wow that is a wonderful psalm I should commit that psalm to memory and it's Psalm 121 and I want to share it with you this morning because I feel it's just a, a great encouragement uh, to us uh, at any time but especially in the times that we're living now where uh, every day seems a bit uncertain uh, in terms of our normal routine so many things are, are changing it feels like every day and so uh, I'm going to share this with you, and I trust that it will encourage you. As I share it, I want to, you to take note of how many times it says, um, it says in this psalm that the Lord watches over you, okay? The word watch is in there quite a bit. It says, so Psalm 121, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will not slumber or sleep. The Lord will watch over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from our all harm. He will watch over your life. And I love this end, this last verse. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going, both now and forevermore. And so I was like, wow, that is an encouragement to me at any time, but especially in the days that we're living right now. And so I trust that uh, that can be an encouragement to you to know that the Lord is watching over us. Uh, you know, in the midst of these times where life is changing rapidly all around us, uh, we can know that our faith and our trust is in God who says he never changes. It says in Hebrews uh, that uh, chapter 13 that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday today and forever and it also says in Hebrews chapter 13 that he will never leave us nor forsake us so we can rest assured that God is with us and he is watching over us so I just wanted to share that with you to encourage you and so this morning uh, we have um, Angie has um, kind of a, a, some things she wants to share that the Lord's been really stirring in her heart and, uh, and so she's going to uh, take some time to share that. 
and then uh, I'm gonna uh, share uh, some stuff that's been stirring in me as it's uh, related, building on the stuff, the things that we've talked about the last two weeks. And so, uh, so Angie, uh, yeah, what? Uh, oh, maybe, uh, maybe before we do that, maybe we should just uh, have a word of prayer too. Sure. I just want to adjust the oh the camera, camera a little slightly. Bit. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, I'm not really centered. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and we do want to say, if you're if you're tuning in on Facebook Live, uh, uh, feel free to say hello in the chat. Clear that. Uh, let us know that you're there. And uh, if you have any comments or questions as we go through, we'd love to hear from you. And if you have any prayer requests, feel free to uh, um, to say those as well. But uh, yeah, feel free to just. Say hello. <laughs> yeah, so we've seen that a few of you are on. So Don and Sharon, great to have you. And I see that Dana and uh, Bob, I think, is probably on too. And Mom, I see that yeah, you're yeah. on. Yeah, the best uh, mother-in-law in the world. <laughs> Michael, we saw that you were on. And, I, and I'm not quite sure. I'm trying to get on here to see uh, on the yeah. other. But uh, yeah. anyways, it's not. It seems to be working. So yeah. working and working. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, we can sort of see where eyesight maybe isn't as... <laughs> great as it used to be but that's okay but it's all right yes. so uh, anyway let's uh why don't you lead us in an open prayer okay so father we thank you that mm. you're with us and yep. we thank you for the promise that jesus gave us that you will never leave us you will never forsake us so we thank you that you're here mm -hmm. and we thank you for your promise of the holy spirit that the holy spirit is with us too so we just ask for your leading and your guiding yes in this time that we spend together that um, you would speak to us that you would speak to our hearts mm. that that you would um, just be alive, show your show your presence among us. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're asking today. In mm -hmm. Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, um, let's carry on then. And Angie, why don't you share uh, some of the things that have been God's been really stirring in you? Maybe you could even say a bit about what we were doing yesterday for a good part of the day. Um, Oh, yes. I said, what were we doing yesterday? Uh, we were on the nationwide prayer call uh, yesterday. Um, from It started at 10 in the morning and it went till after 9 at night. And so we actually didn't get on till about 10.30 in the morning. Uh, but we were on pretty much the whole the whole day. I mean, there was times that we were doing things, right? But um, yeah, that was really encouraging um, to be praying for our nation in this time. So yeah, with, with leaders all across Canada, every, uh, every province kind of had an hour. Uh, on this, I was hosted by Faitin um, Brzezinski or Brzezinski. Some I don't do real good with the last <laughs> name, but uh, just a wonderful woman who's leading the charge of kind of gathering leaders together across Canada. So it was yeah, really inspiring yeah. to hear all the prayers and to see what God is doing across this country in the midst of these uh, these turbulent times uh, in society. So yeah, thankful for her and thankful for the the all the leaders that were on. Across Canada that was great they took segments of the nation um, and yeah. leaders from the different churches and ministries and those areas so that was great um, what the Lord's been speaking to me you know um, this week um, I woke up one night during the night and I and I've been taking to praying during the night which is not that unusual but um, actually I been sleeping quite well which is a good thing but one night I was awake and it was I was it was in between 2 30 and 3 in the morning and I just started praying and I and I heard the word disruption and um, and I thought well that's really kind of what is happening here we're in a major disruption in in the world in Canada in 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 our lives right now and so um, I woke up and I was like, what was that word that I heard in the middle of the night? And I'm pretty sure it was disruption. So, you know, I've been pondering disruptions. You know, what is a disruption? You know, like a disruption is a little different than an interruption. I think maybe they're kind of the same thing, but I think of being an interruption being if I'm working away and I get a phone call, it's an interruption. I get right back after the phone call, I get right back into what I was doing. Doesn't really, other than timing, it doesn't really affect the outcome, but a disruption, um, you know, I was looking at some um, definitions of disruption. It's a disturbance or a problem which interrupt an event activity or process, but then there's also a disruptive innovation, you know, and that's talking about in business theory. It's something that creates a new market or a new network, or it eventually disrupts an existing market and value networks, something like, um, that would be something like the internet, 
yeah. when that came in. It yeah. changed the way we did things, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking, you know, an interruption. You know, a number of years ago, we got a call um, in the morning, earlier in the morning. Um, our daughter had been on the way, her way to work and had been in an accident. And I don't remember why you were home that morning, because usually he would be at work, but for some reason, I don't know if you had an appointment or whatever, you answered the phone that morning about eight o'clock. She had been in an accident. You know, that wasn't just an interruption to the day. That was a disruption. Right. Um, you know, we got in the car, we went to the accident site. She was in an ambulance on the way to the hospital. We ended up at the hospital. We had to arrange where the car was going. And, and that car was totaled. <laughs> that car was done. And we needed to get a new car. It was car. a disruption. It was a disruption. <laughs> we had to, you know, it, there was a new way of functioning. There had to be a, a, a different car, a new car. Uh, well, it's a different car um, at that time. So, you know, so we're in a disruption and it may mean a change in the way we're doing things. And, you know, it got me thinking, I was like, okay, Lord, you know, I understand we're in this disruption, but like, what are you saying in the disruption? What are you doing? And I thought about some disruptions that actually God caused. <laughs> Uh, for some people, some, some biblical people in the Bible. And so I was thinking on that. I was thinking about Moses. You know, Moses, uh, he had uh, an unusual start to life. Mm -hmm. He was born in a time when all the babies were being murdered in, um, in Egypt because the king was afraid that they would rise up in power. The Israelites were becoming too strong. So he was saved from that time and he was saved from by Pharaoh's own daughter. He was raised in the palace. He was a man of privilege, even though he had, you know, a, a, an Israeli, a, a, an Israelite, a Hebrew, they called them Hebrews at that time. Um, he was one of them, but he was raised in prominence as an Egyptian in the Egyptian palace. And when he grew up, he was out and he saw the oppression of his people. And what did he do? He took matters into his own hands and he killed an Egyptian who was beating uh, a Hebrew person and it became known and he fled. And so for years, he was on the backside of the desert mm -hmm. herding sheep, you know, he was a shepherd. And, and one day after years and years and years and years, he had an encounter with God. There was a disruption mm -hmm. to his life. You see, I think that we need to understand in this time, we serve a God who sees we serve a God who sees and he saw what was happening. He saw what was happening and he knew that he had a promise to the Israelites. He had a promise to the Hebrew people. And that promise stemmed from a promise that he gave Abraham. And so he remembered, he remembered that he was going to take this people who found themselves in slavery and he was going to take them through a wilderness process. He was going to take them to the promised land, but he needed somebody to lead that um, process. And so his eye was on Moses. Moses even felt that call when he had killed the Egyptian, right? Like he felt the injustice. He, he felt all of that. It was actually part of his call, but it was premature at that time. But here he was years later, 40 years later, actually, herding sheep. And, um, and there he saw a burning bush. It was a disruption to his day. Not just an interruption, a disruption because the Lord spoke to him. He actually, he had to turn and he said, you know, I've seen burning bushes before, but this one's kind of unusual because um, the bush is not really burning. There's a fire all around it. There's a fire, <laughs> different fire in the fireplace <laughs> today. There was a fire burning, but the bush didn't burn up. And he's like, this is unusual. This is unusual. So he turned aside and he looked. And when he looked, the Lord spoke to him. So he had an encounter with the Lord in that time. And the Lord said, you know, I'm going to send you back. You know, you're going to lead my people, you know. And, and Moses was kind of like, he wasn't on board with this. He's like, you know what? Like, maybe you should send somebody else. I don't speak well. I, you know, I, I'm not a good orator. I don't, I don't think that I can do this. But, you know, I believe that there's something that we need to learn in this about the disruptions. God has a plan, and if he's calling you, he will equip you, and that's what he did with Moses. So the Moses is the first one I think of with disruptions. Um, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot of stories, but the other one that I wanted to bring to mind was uh, Saul of Tarsus. So that story is recorded in Acts chapter 9, and this was at a time after um, Jesus had died and had been resurrected and the church had been born, and, and the a lot of the, the um, Jewish 
scholars at that time, they weren't on board. They didn't believe that Jesus really was the Son of God. They didn't believe that that was happening, and they wanted to squash this movement that was happening. They wanted to squash it, and so Paul of Sarsus actually was a Pharisee. He was well-versed in the law. You know, we were just talking about Moses. Moses actually wrote the law out of Revelation, but for God gave him. Um, Paul, Saul, sorry, Saul, later Paul, um, studied this. He was a Pharisee among Pharisees. He had a good understanding of that, the Word of God, of the, the scriptures, but he was, and he was zealous, but he was trying to persecute the church because he thought they are in error, right? And so he was putting them in prison. He was seeing that they were killed, um, and he was on his way with um, signed orders from the, uh, the, not the church, from the Sanhedrin the, the, in, um, in Jerusalem to go to Damascus and do the same thing that he was doing there, wreaking terror in the hearts of, of the Christians. And um, on the way, see, we can be zealous, we can have an understanding, but unless we have that encounter, he had a major disruption on the way. On the way on that road, he had an encounter with Jesus. It disrupted yeah. his whole life. Right. And so what he did is he saw this bright light from heaven. It stopped him in his tracks and he heard a voice from heaven. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he was like, oh my gosh, who are you, Lord? He said, and, and, and Jesus spoke to him and he said, I'm Jesus. You know, and he was told to go into Damascus and wait there. And you know what happened to him is he actually became blind in that encounter. And, um, and so he went into Damascus and he was waiting he was fasting and praying mm -hmm. seeking God about what was happening and he has a vision in that time and in this vision he sees a man named Ananias come to him and um, lay hands on him and pray and that he would receive his sight well Holy Spirit speaks to Ananias and says I want you to go to Judas's house on straight street so he gets the instructions where he needs to go and he says I want you to lay hands and pray for Saul of Tarsus yeah. that he would receive his sight and Ananias is a little bit afraid you know this is a disruption to his life too he's like well interruption disruption he's like I don't want to go really do you know who he is Lord he's the one who's persecuting us I don't really want to get yeah. in 10 feet of him I don't even want to get in six feet of him this can't be the Lord speaking he yeah. probably is thinking yeah <laughs> but he did it yeah. And he prayed for him and it says like scale like things fell from Saul's eyes. You know what? Like God got a hold of Saul because he had a he had a purpose for him. You know, he could use Saul. Saul had a great understanding of the scriptures. He had a great mm -hmm. understanding then of what Jesus meant in regards to the scriptures. And he was used not to the Jews, but to the Gentiles to mm -hmm. bring salvation to them. And so that was a huge disruption. Um, in the life of Saul and later he became known as Paul, Paul the Apostle. Um, I'm going to skip to the next chapter. So we were in Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 10. There's a story of Cornelius. I love this story of Cornelius because this was also an interruption in his day. It was a disruption mm -hmm. in his life. But as I said before, God sees. God sees. And what God saw in Cornelius's life was a beautiful thing and what Cornelius was is he was a Roman centurion so he was a Gentile he wasn't part of God's chosen people which were the, the Jewish people but he had a heart to bless and he blessed the Jewish people and he he gave money to the poor and he did all sorts of wonderful things he had a great heart and he actually would take time and he would pray and one of those times when he was praying something happened a disruption to his life an angel actually showed up and said to him you know yet God has seen you know his gifts his his offerings his alms to the poor it had come up before the Lord as a as a fragrant offering you know it had come up before the Lord and the Lord had you know him on his radar and so he sends an angel and he says you know what I want you to send for Simon Peter I want you to send for Peter. He's in such and such a house in Joppa. Send for him. And he's going to come and tell you about salvation. And this was unheard of for Peter. That's when he had had this trans where he saw this um, 
this um, tarp being lowered that had all sorts of food in it, animals in it that the Israelites were forbidden to eat. And he was told to take and eat. And he's like, I'm not doing that. And then these men came that were Gentiles and, and they didn't like to associate in that way with them. But God said, go, you know what? And, and salvation came to that house because he told them about Jesus. Mm -hmm. He told them about the message of salvation. And I feel like in this time of disruption that we're in, God wants to do something in us because he sees, he sees um, what it is that he wants to do. He sees our hearts, you know? And so, um, so Moses he didn't feel like he was adequate, but God said, you're adequate for the task. You know what? Sometimes God's calling us to some things. And I, I think these are a time in times of disruption. These are the times when God mm -hmm. is speaking and we just need to say, you know what? You know what? I won't trust in my own abilities. Even I'll trust in you. I'll trust in what you're saying to me. And mm -hmm. I'll move forward with that. Paul, he had um, a lot of zeal, but he didn't have the right understanding. And so this is a time of disruption where we can, get more understanding as to what God's calling us. And Cornelius, he had a wonderful heart and God wants to speak to those two that have a wonderful heart and take mm -hmm. it to a new place, a new place of encounter with him. And so, um, so these are exciting times mm -hmm. that we're living in, even in all the disruption that God wants to do something in the, the disruption. Um, one other thing, in between those two stories in Acts 9 and Acts 10, the end of Acts 9, it's a there's two stories that are little, little stories that are wedged in there where Peter is, is, um, does some miracles. And the one is a man named Aeneas, who's a paralytic, and he heals him. He says, get up. And the other is Dorcas, also known as Tabitha. And she had died. She had been done great things among her people. You know, she was a server. She had a servant's heart. She made clothes and gave food and, you know, like just was a, a wonderful person. She died and Peter raised her from the dead. And he said the same thing as he said to the paralytic. He said, get up, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think it's a time when God is speaking to his church. Those of us who have felt paralyzed, maybe we're paralyzed with fear. Maybe we were paralyzed for whatever reason we're, we're, we're on our mats, but he's saying, get up. It's time to get up mm -hmm. and even to have yes. a, like some of us are dead and sleeping you know wake up oh sl slumberer and, and rise yeah. Christ is shining on you and so I think you know those those two little stories kind of tie it all together mm -hmm. that it's time to arise and that's what we're about to rise now right on well and you know I love I love all of those stories they're all uh, very uh, appropriate and and uh, really applicable for the season that we're in uh, and and but in particular, the story of Saul, who later became Paul, when he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus, literally, he his whole life changed. And, and I like to think of it how his theology changed, his belief system. He was believing before that that Jesus was a hoax. He was not the Messiah. He, you know, anybody who was following him deserves to be punished. And all of a sudden... Jesus appears to him and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And his answer to him is, who are you, Lord? And so in that moment, Saul's theology changed because he encountered Jesus. And as we are in this, the midst of these disruptive times, I, I think there's probably hardly a person in the world right now who has not had their normal way of life disrupted. And how do we respond in the midst of these times uh, how we respond in the midst of these times is, is based on the theology that we build our lives on. Everybody has a theology. Uh, everybody has a worldview, how we view the world and how we're going to function in it. And in the midst of these times, I want to urge you to seek God so that you can have an encounter with Him, no matter what your theology is, whether you believe in Him and are living for Him, uh, daily or whether you're not even sure he really exists or wherever you're at in this journey of faith, I encourage you to call out to God so that you can have an encounter and that Angie and I, we want to be calling out so that we can keep having encounters with him uh, each and every day as it so that it will shape our theology and our worldview so that we can respond to the things that are around us as people of faith and as people of hope. Uh, because that is who he's calling us to be. You know, Jesus said that his followers are the salt of the earth. And he said that his followers are the light of the world. And, and salt is not good. 
if it's just kept within the salt shaker. It has to be shaken out and put onto something. And so you and I, as followers of Jesus, we need to be shaken out now. I mean, we can't really be out of our house too much, but there are ways we can connect and be an encouragement and we can be the salt of the earth in this time. And there's ways that we can be the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, uh, Jesus said. And so we want to be that light uh, and encourage you to, uh, to join us in that journey that these are the times for us to arise uh, in the midst of these disruptions. And so I'm going to, I want to share building on um, uh, a little bit of what we talked about the last two weeks. And, and so uh, two weeks ago, I shared about building on the solid foundation, which is Jesus, so that when the storms come, that the house, uh, you know, that we will not crash, that we will be firm and, uh, uh, and we will be well established and, and how we want to be people of faith, not people of fear. And then last week, we talked about uh, the living hope that is within us as followers of Jesus, that he's given us this living hope that we, in the midst of whatever is happening around us, we can still be called, we can still be people of hope. What is uh, hope? From a biblical perspective, hope is a confident expectation in who God is and what he says he will do. I love that phrase, confident expectation. And so, so in the midst of these times that are, that are changing rapidly all around us, we can have a confident expectation that God is faithful and that we can um, rest assured in that and we don't have to live in, in fear. We can have faith rising up within us. Faith, being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And so, uh, as I was pondering, you know, this week and, and things kind of percolate in me as I, as I uh, go through life and as I drive around in my buses, I'm, I'm still uh, uh, fortunate enough to be able to go to work in these times. And, and uh, I was pondering about uh, some verses that I've memorized in the last little while that have to do with hope and endurance. Okay, and so there's this passage in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Um, sorry, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Try to get the, the reference right. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, where uh, Paul starts off by saying like this, he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all compassion, the God of all comfort. Wow, that's beautiful. The God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those with, in any trouble with the comfort we are, ourselves have received. For just as we share in the abundant sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds in Christ. So he's, he's painting this picture that there's going to be uh, some suffering, but there's also going to be comfort in the midst of it. Then he says, if we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort and I'll get this, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And I was like, wow, that phrase, patient endurance of the same sufferings that, that Paul was referring to that he suffers. And so then jump over to 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1. Uh, Paul is writing there and he says, uh, he says, I'm continually uh, praying for you. I, I, I continually mention you in my prayers and, and I'm thankful for you. And then he goes on and he says, we come before, we remember you before our God and Father and we're, we're remembering your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So do you get the connection? you see where I'm going with this? If we're going to endure, if we're going to last long, if we're going to endure to the end, it's going to be because we have hope. And hope is that confident expectation. And so, so hope is meant to, to, to prompt in us this patient endurance. It's meant to bring this, this willingness to persevere that we are going to hang in there to the end. And, and you know, we... Uh, we, we quickly realize in this time of, uh, that we're in, in, in this COVID-19 virus that's going around the world, that this race, this part of the race that we're in is not a sprint. 
it's you know uh, uh, one of the big events in the Olympics is the hundred meter dash, right? It's it's sort of the marquee event, and everybody tunes in, and it's over in nine point seven seconds or nine point six or whatever, and and it, it is done, right? Well, this is not a sprint, and much of life is not a sprint. It is more like the marathon that keeps going and going and going, right? And so we want to have that patient endurance. We want to endure to the end. I was reminded of uh, in Revelation, uh, the chapters two and three, there uh, uh, John was receiving this revelation when he's on the Isle of Patmos, and, and he got seven letters to, uh, to churches, to seven different churches, and they're, they're written out in Revelation chapter two and three. And there is a common theme in each one of those letters. There's the same two phrases are used in each of the seven letters. And, and these, this, these are the phrases. The first one is, to him who overcomes. What is an overcomer? Well, an overcomer is someone who, who gets over an obstacle, who, who doesn't stay back, who doesn't get conquered. You know, it tells us in, in Romans that we are more than a conqueror. Well, how can you be more than a conqueror? Well, possibly it's because we uh, are, are able to conquer because of what Jesus has done for us and, and the Holy Spirit living in us. He enables us to overcome, to be more than a conqueror. So that's, that, that's phrase one, is we are more than conquerors. Or sorry, that's not in, in Revelation, that's from Romans. But to him who overcomes. And then it tells us what we will receive when we overcome. And the second phrase is this. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And so uh, we all have ears. Uh, some of us hear better than others. And, uh, and even if our ears aren't functioning real well, you know, there are ways that we can still hear. Um, even if our physical ears aren't functioning real well, we can still hear the voice of God. We can hear the Spirit of God speaking. And so I feel like that message in, in the, the letters to those seven churches is what the Spirit is highlighting to us in this time, is that we need to be overcomers. How do we be an overcomer? We endure. We endure. We have that patient endurance that was uh, I talked about from First Corinthians or Second Corinthians chapter one. We we have that endurance that is inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, as I mentioned from First Thessalonians chapter one. And so, I want to uh, share a few thoughts with you about endurance. Uh, I've spent. Um, uh, and I was going to bring one of my books into the picture here this morning, but um, well, we, we don't have to get it at this point, but it, uh, okay, Angie will get it. So uh, I wrote, wrote a, I've written three books uh, and they're all about seats that I've sat on uh, and learned a few things. So lessons learned on the seat of my bus, lessons learned on the seat of my bike and lessons learned on the seat of my truck. But the one I want to highlight here this morning is lessons learned from the seat of my bike. Over a period of about 15 years, uh, I did uh, participated in probably somewhere over 200 mountain bike races. And, uh, and I learned a lot of things about life and about my faith in the midst of these mountain bike races. I, um, I learned a lot about endurance. Uh, a number of the races that I did were, were shorter races that were like an hour to an hour and a half long. And, and uh, there you, you go hard uh, a lot quicker and, and a lot longer and, uh, and you pace yourself in a different way. But I've also participated in, in numerous races, uh, six, six hours and eight hours in length where I was um, uh, doing them solo. Now a lot of those races you can go in, um, in uh, and this is, this is the book, although on Facebook Live it's going to be all backwards. But, uh, so there you go, lessons learned on the seat of my bike. And uh, I would do these uh, six and eight hour races solo. And, uh, and Angie thought I was kind of nuts. And, and I remember one of my nephews uh, yelling out at one of the races, uh, telling me, thinking that I'm having a midlife crisis. <laughs> that I, was I think one. it was the 24 hour that I thought you were really nuts. Yeah, yeah. But, well, but anyway, uh, and that one really didn't go well. But, <laughs> was but you know what, hour. in the midst of, Almost every race, whether it's a short one or a long one, but especially the long ones, 
there comes a point in that race where I would be just like, oh, why am I doing this? I just want to quit. <laughs> like, I do not want to keep going. What is, like, I mean, your body starts to hurt and, and you're just like, oh, this is tough going. I do not want to keep going. And, uh, and, but you know, one of the phrases that would go through my head that would keep me going, and, and I think it can be, it can be, this can be a helpful thing uh, in, in all kinds of things that we face where we want to quit and we, we want to stop. We want to not keep on enduring whatever it is we're facing. And uh, it's this phrase. It, it was, um, if I quit today, I'll regret it tomorrow. Because quitting today seems very appealing. It, and when your body's hurting and you just don't think you can turn those pedals once one more time around, your legs are cramping, and quitting seems like the best option. But I just be like, no, if I quit today, I'm going to regret it tomorrow. And so I keep going. And I keep going. So I didn't live with that regret of, of quitting. And so that is one of the things that really motivates us to keep going in the midst of, of trials, in the midst of unknown situations, so that we can keep going. And so um, I wanted to share three, uh, uh, four actually, four uh, uh, words that start with E that, uh, that really help us with endurance. And the first one is encouragement. You know, if we are going to last to the end, if we are going to endure whatever comes our way, we are going to need encouragement. We are not going to be able to do it on our own. We're going to need others. And, and I think to the bike races where I'm, I'm hurting and my legs are, are just killing me and my body is just crying out, stop, stop. And then there'd be somebody alongside of the trail who would say, keep going, you're looking great. And I'm thinking, you're a liar, I look horrible. <laughs> but you know what, in the midst of that, even if they, they, even if I didn't look great, but they told me that I was doing great and I was looking good and, and keep pushing, you're, you're going well, and something happened inside of me, I would be like, oh, I gotta keep going. I'm being encouraged. And, and I remember uh, we did this race uh, quite a few years, uh, in a row, it was sort of our last race of the year, the end of September, and uh, the whole bunch of us, the whole team would go down to St. Catharines, and we did this race called the Squeezer, and they had this uh, this finish where we'd, we'd start in the town of St. Catharines, go out and do the trails, and we'd come back and finish in the town, and we'd turn uh, to the finish line and have to climb straight up a fairly steep hill, and Angie, she'd be sitting there right on the corner with her camera, and and while she was taking pictures, she got some good shots. Yeah, yeah. She she would, she would never encourage because I think she can't couldn't do two things at once <laughs> if she was <laughs> Not trying. Not the greatest multitasker. If she was trying to encourage us, she'd mess up the picture. Well, probably. I, yeah. Well, I was concentrating. Yes, well, I and, and she shot. got she got great pictures. So yeah. we're glad for that. But the interesting thing at that race, and if you've watched any cycling races like the Tour de France, you may have seen at some of the races when the fans are lining the roads. There, there's someone who's dressed up like a devil, which yeah. is a bit bizarre to think that the devil is there to encourage you, <laughs> which totally goes pitchfork? against our theology. Yeah. But in that situation, that's what they're there for. And we even had a guy dress up a few years at the Squeezer in this devil costume. Yeah, got some pictures of him too. Mimicking yeah. what was happening <laughs> in the European road race scene. And, and, and you turn up, the, come up that hill and the whole there's just crowds of people and they're cheering and they're going go 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 and you're just dying and but you know what it was amazing the effect that encouragement had on you and I remember one year I got a flat tire uh just a little bit before the finish line and I decided I'm just gonna run it out to the finish line well it turned out I was further away from the finish line than what I thought and, and running when you're wearing bike shoes, which the, the soles of the shoes are very stiff, they're not meant for running. <laughs> they're meant for just riding your bike. It is horrible. So by the time I came to that hill, to run up that hill, the crowd was going nuts because they always cheered the hardest for people who were facing the biggest obstacles. And so it just motivated me to keep going, even though I just wanted to basically crawl up the hill. But encouragement is an incredible force. 
in the lives of us and that as we share it with others. There's this verse in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, starting in verse 23, where it says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Isn't that beautiful? The picture of that there's nothing around us that's going to happen to us, that's going to shift us from our focus of keeping moving forward in a straight direction. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Why? Because he who promised is faithful. Let us consider, says in verse 24 of Hebrews chapter 10, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. And I was like, wow, that is awesome. So, so let's not just think about, uh, let's not just have encouragement flow out of us, well, if it just happens to come out. Let, it says in there, let us consider, let us actually think about it, let us actually plan how we're going to encourage someone else. And, and let us give careful thought to it. You know, a, a good friend of mine, uh, Paul Eckmeyer, uh, he's a retired bus driver and he had a battle with cancer, passed away. Uh, last summer, and he was the greatest encourager uh, in my life that I've ever experienced. And that is because he considered how he was going to encourage me, and he did it regularly. And he inspired me where I want to I want to carry that on. I want to be an encourager to others. And that's what we're hoping, uh, what we're sharing with you today, what Angie shared about disruption, what I'm sharing about endurance, that it is his encouragement to you. We've been considering it all week, and now we're sharing it with you. And trust that it will be an encouragement, that it will spur you on. As I think of that phrase, spur you on, you know, I grew up on a farm, and, and we had to herd cattle around, and sometimes they needed some spurring on, you know. They needed some encouragement. We had the dog that would nip at their heels, and we had some uh, sticks and various things that we would kind of encourage them with to get them to, you know, tap them to go in the right direction. And that is, is what the encouragement that we share with each other is for. It's to spur us on towards love and good deeds. And it's through that encouragement that we can endure. The second thing that I want to share about uh, endurance that is really key is our eyes. And I have a whole chapter in this book about eyes. And in that chapter, I tell, talk about how the best tip that I ever received as a mountain biker was about my eyes. And it was this, uh, your eyes steer the bike, not your hands on the handlebars. And you're thinking, wow, is that really true? Well, yes, it is true. Because what I'm looking at is where I'm going to end up going. So, so we would be, uh, you know, riding through these uh, rock gardens or sharp corners with, you know, where you could go over the cliff beside or various uh, kinds of terrain. And, and it was so crucial to focus your eyes in the direction you wanted to go. Because if I got distracted by uh, something off to the side, uh, I would usually uh, end up in trouble. And I often ended up off the trail and maybe wiping out. And, uh, and so our eyes are so crucial. What we focus on, what we look at, what consumes our attention, that is what we become and the direction in which we head. So in the midst of, of this time where, where the world is, is, is disrupted and, and uh, there's so much news about the virus that you can kind of consume yourself with, and, and, and I do like to keep up on sort of what is happening. But in the midst of all of that, I want to keep my eyes focused on Jesus. You know, there's this wonderful passage in Hebrews uh, chapter 12, uh, verse, starting in verse 1. But actually, let me start in uh, the last couple verses of chapter 11. Because chapter 11 of Hebrews is what we commonly know as the faith chapter. And it lists all these great people of faith. Uh, that we read about in the Old Testament. And then at the end of that chapter, it says, uh, these were all commended for their faith, but none of them received what they had been promised. Uh, God had a better plan, that only together with us would they be made perfect. So the idea is that God had promised all these things, and these people were longing for it, but they were going to have to watch it happen from afar. Uh, because Jesus says in, uh, in Matthew chapter 13, he says, Blessed are you that you, because of what you see, you see the things that you see and you hear the things that you hear. For many righteous people, uh, prophets and righteous people of long ago, longed to see the things that you see, but did not see them. Longed to hear the things that you hear, but did not hear them. 
And so, so you get this picture of, of these people that, that are, are, are uh, they didn't get what they had, were longing for. But God chose us in this time uh, of um, the church age to be the fulfillment of those promises. And I share that because now it helps you better understand what it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, all of those people, all of those prophets and righteous people of long ago that Jesus refers to in Matthew chapter 13, they are in this cloud of witnesses and they are like those people lining the streets of St. Catherine's at the bike race when I'm coming up that hill. They are, they are cheering us on. They're saying, go, go. You, are, you can do it. Don't give up. You can make it through to the end. And then he goes on. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders. Because in a bike race, as in life, you don't want to carry extra weight. You want to you wanna, uh, be as light as possible. Uh, I don't uh, strap extra stuff to my bike uh, in a race that I might use on a training ride. I want to be as, as light as possible so that I can be as efficient as possible. So throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. Let me tell you a quick story about the sin that so easily entangles us. So, so in the squeezer one year, uh, I decided I'm going to go real hard at the start and stay right up with the lead pack. And because there's, it's kind of a uh, through the town and then you're on this big wide open gravel trail. So the first three or so kilometers are all, uh, are all really fast, right? And I was doing really well and I'm, and I'm in the lead bunch there and, and all of a sudden, my, we're riding down this gravel path with grass at the sides and, and uh, all of a sudden my gears start jumping. Like, and I was like, what is going on? Like, all the, like, like going up and down and I'm not shifting anything. And I, and I look and I got, and I, and I pull over cause I can't keep going. And I look and there's a long, um, reed, a stalk of grass about this long that was dead that was laying at the side that somehow it got sucked up into my, into the rear uh, cassette, the gears on my bike, and it had tangled everything up and I was going nowhere. Mm -hmm. The sin that so easily entangles us, that's what sin does in your life and mine. It stops us dead in our race and we need to stop and we need to untangle it. So I pulled that out and I was good to go. And so that's what we need to do when the sin entangles, when we when we fail. And, and, and I'm not saying that, to condemn you when you fail because we are in a season of grace where when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we can be free from that. Throwing off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. Let us run with perseverance the race marked, for out, make, marked out for us. He goes on in Hebrews chapter 12. Then he says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. Wow. Jesus gave us the next point is the example. But when we fix our eyes on him, he will lead us and he will guide us. So we've talked about encouragement. We've talked about our eyes, focusing them on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. The third E word is example. Jesus is our example. Fix your eyes on Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scoring his shame. And it says in verse 1 how the race is marked out for us. Well, let me tell you another story about mountain biking. There was uh, one year we were going to have a race at a place we had never been. And we always loved as mountain bikers going to race sites that we have never been at. Uh, but we would often try to go and pre-ride the course um, when... Oh, our fire. Yeah. There we go. We'll get it back on. <laughs> Yes, yeah. these fires uh, that are electronic, <laughs> they work wonderfully. <laughs> so so we were going to race where we had never raced and, and there we had the option to go pre-ride the course and to go check it out. So I went, uh, I think it was the week or two before and, and lo and behold, I got to ride the course with the two fellas who designed the course. They had built it and I got to do a lap with them and it was awesome. 
I was riding right behind them and they were saying, oh, watch out on this corner. And, and when we come to this rock garden, there's a little kind of crack in the, in the one rock. Just put your front wheel in there and you'll just roll right over. And on and on the tips came and I was like, wow, you guys want to just do the race with me? <laughs> and, and I thought that is just a great example of how we can fix our eyes on Jesus. And he is the example. You know, it tells us in Hebrews chapter 4 that... Um, that uh, we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with us in our weakness because no, he was tempted in every way just as we are. And then in Hebrews 12, one of the verses I quoted there, it tells us that we are to run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. Jesus is the course designer of this race of faith that we are in. And then not only did he design the course, he came down and wrote it. He rode the whole course and set an example for us of how to live this life of faith in him. And so we can fix our eyes on him and in the midst of whatever we're facing, all of these things that want to distract us and, and take our focus off of him, we can focus on him and he can lead us through everything that we're facing and we can endure with that. Well, the last E word I want to talk about is the end. And this is a phrase that comes from uh, Matthew chapter 24, I believe it's verse 13, where Jesus said, he who endures to the end will be saved. And you know, if we're going to endure, we want to endure to the end. We want to we wanna finish the race. No one remembers the person who quit halfway through the race or the person who, uh, who almost made it to the end and then, and then you know, didn't make it. Uh, in the results of the races that I used to be in, if you didn't cross the finish line, you had a DNF, did not finish beside your name. Or if you did something that disqualified you, you had a DQ beside your name. That was that would be really bad uh, to have that. But we don't want to be DQ'd. We don't want to have a DNF. We want to have our name on the end results. And how do we do that? It's by enduring to the end. And that's that commitment that we will not give up. I remember um, I did this race about five years ago at Mount St. Anne and Mount St. Anne is a place we've been to numerous times and I just love to ride my mountain bike there. It's one of the best places <laughs> in Canada to do that and, uh, and part of that race I knew that I'm going to have to climb up the back side of Mount St. Anne and I had done it before but not in a race and I knew it once you get out onto that hill or onto that mountain and you, you, you climb and you have no break till you get to the top. Like some of the climbs that we did, you know, they'd have little, little breaks where you could kind of catch your breath. Well, this one had no breaks. And so I came out onto that hill and I looked up and there's people riding and there's a lot of people walking. And, and once you, once you stop pedaling, you're done. You got to walk. And I was like, no way, I am not stopping pedaling. I am going to keep going. And I, I mean, this is all I could take to everything in me to keep those pedals going around. But I made it to the top without uh, walking by keeping pedaling. And it's that determination. It's that diligence. It's that perseverance. It's that, uh, that um, willingness to suffer. You know, many times in a bike race, uh, when we, Angie and I love to watch the Tour de France, they say it's not always the person who's the most fit or who's the best rider who wins, but it's the person who's willing to suffer the most, who is the winner of the race. And, and so are we willing to endure? Are we willing to, to go as Paul talked about in the verse I quoted earlier, first or second Corinthians chapter one, have patient endurance in the midst of suffering. And so we want to endure to the end. And how do we do that? It's through the encouragement. It's through the fixing our eyes on Jesus and following his example. And so you and I can have that endurance that comes from hope that is in Jesus. And so I, I trust that that's encouraged you today. Uh, I know that I, I get encouraged a lot when I talk about this, uh, this kind of stuff because, uh, uh, man, we all, we all need this, this kind of a message and uh, with whatever we're facing. And so we just want to encourage you today with that. And if, if this has encouraged you, uh, we just encourage you to, to leave a comment in the, in the, in the comments uh, option as you're watching uh, or give us a wave or a like or something. We, we just would love to interact with you and, uh, and trust that, uh, that God will um, see us through 
these times. You know, we we don't know what tomorrow holds. I said the first week that we did this, we've never known what tomorrow holds, but now it even feels more so. Uh, we don't know what tomorrow holds, but in the midst of whatever is happening around us, God is our rock, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. Uh, we can have hope, we can have faith, and we can endure to the end. Amen. Yeah. That was a good word. That was a good word. Thank you so much for, for being with us today. I mean, we didn't, um, you know, highlight who all, and I, I didn't actually have a thing where I can actually see who's all on, but I, I did notice. Uh, so, you know, thank you, Anita, for coming on, and Barry, and I, we saw Mary was on, and Bev, and Barb, and, um, you know, if we didn't call you out, we're sorry about that, but... Uh, <laughs> no, that's okay. Maybe some don't want to be called out. Yeah, so. maybe you don't want to be called <laughs> but, out. But uh, thank you so much. We're just delighted for, yeah. if, if you, for watching this live and if you uh um check in on the replay later god bless you as well and uh we, let's just uh close with a word i think of we prayer. want to speak about next week okay first so yeah so next week um we're we will have something at 10 o'clock sunday morning uh, it uh, it we'll, probably won't be live. We'll probably do a premium event because yeah. Paul's actually supposed to be on the milk truck next week. Yeah, so supposed to drive he, won't next be, Sunday morning. he won't be around here. But, but we uh, will have something broadcasting um, and there may be some live thing. Uh, yeah, a premium point, event. But, I can, you know, we can do some testing. Just stay tuned to our, our Facebook. Uh, Facebook and on uh, our website, arisenow.ca. We'll right. let you know what we're doing. What, what the plan uh, is yeah, for sure. Because we talked about whether we should keep it at 10 or do it some other time. But uh, we'll... To be determined. To be, yes. <laughs> to be announced. Yeah. So uh, anyway, that's good. But uh, why don't you uh, lead us in uh, prayer again to close then. Father, we thank you that we're your children. We thank mm -hmm. you that, um, that you hold us in your hands and that we don't need to be afraid mm -hmm. in these times. That your peace, the peace that passes understanding, the peace that keeps our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, that peace... Mm -hmm is accessible to us. Yes. So we ask for that peace, mm -hmm. that peace to come and rest in us, around us, that you would speak peace to the storms and that we would be able to rise up in faith to speak peace to mm -hmm. the storms around us. Yes. We ask, Father, that we would have those encounters with you, those disruptions in this time of disruption mm -hmm. where you would redirect our thoughts, you would redirect um, our steps. Mm -hmm in this time, that we would come into alignment with everything that you have for us, that we would have understanding in these times um, of how to walk yes. each day mm -hmm. with you. Thank you that um, you have called us to endurance, mm -hmm. that you empower us for endurance, and that you give us the tools to endure. Yes. We give you thanks and we give you praise for that. We, Father, we ask that this week that you would uh, be very real mm -hmm. to all of us in ways that we maybe have not experienced before. Yes, Lord. And we thank you in advance in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. Well, you know, we always conclude our two-minute videos with the phrase, stay awake and stay alert. Well, that is uh, uh, more applicable now than ever, uh, that we want to always uh, be awake and alert as we follow Jesus in the midst of the season that we're in. So let's just uh, conclude with that. So that's all for now. And until we meet again, stay awake and stay alert.